man vorstellen. Äh, der hält heute einen Vortrag über Near Field Communication. Ähm, noch ein Satz von mir dazu. Also ich finde das ein sehr interessantes Thema. Das wird unser Alltag verändern und äh, ist eine Form von Datenkommunikation über sehr nahe Distanzen. Und ja, äh, hört gut zu. Es wird euch alle betreffen in der nahen Zukunft und viel Spaß damit. Thanks. Um, I'm also going to do my uh, talk in English, so sorry for that. If you don't understand something, ask. Um, so um, I'm also going to ask some questions. Who of you has heard already about near field communication or NFC? Who believes has used it already? No, it's only two percent. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> don't laugh. It's coming. Uh, just a few words about history or where it's coming from. Um, in 2004, there was an ISO or IEC spec uh, 18092, uh, near field communication interface and protocol, or short NFC IP-1. Um, it's the ISO standard which combines previous standards towards the NFC standard. I'm going to talk a bit about more about uh, the pre-existing standards and how they came together. Uh, in the same year, um, an industry forum was founded, the NFC forum, uh, with founding members Nokia, Philips, and Sony, and a few others. Right now, there are more than 150 companies in that, including Microsoft, Samsung, a lot of chip uh, manufacturers, and pretty much everyone you can think of, well, except Apple, but that's another story. Um, then, two years later already, Nokia was the first company to introduce NFC technology in a smart, well, in a telephone, in a mobile flip phone, the Nokia 6131. Um, then in 2010, we saw the first Android device uh, with NFC embedded, that was the Nexus S uh, by Samsung. And then now we come to year 2012, we have so-called NFC tags, which I will talk about more a bit later, uh, by companies like Sony, which market them directly to customers as useful consumer products. Um, Samsung has a competitor product called Tactiles for their own smartphones, uh, just a comparison, and there are a lot more uh, available by brick and mortar stores, but I'm gonna talk about that later. Um, just to give a little bit of highlight what happened the last few weeks, uh, MasterCard released um, their PayPass SDK, which is um, an application development kit for Android or BlackBerry, which allows you to implement their wireless NFC PayPass technology uh, into any app you decide, and you can then use it uh, with your smartphone to pay or do whatever financial transaction you desire with MasterCard. All right, um, so a few words about where NFC technology is coming from. Uh, as Mr. Grumma I talked before me, um, there were these previous existing smart card, contactless smart card standards uh, based on ISO 14443. Uh, and there's an additional one in Japan by Sony which is called Felicia or Felica or whatever you want to call it. It's short for Felicity Cards. Uh, both of those are currently in use, for example, by paying uh, for paying in the metro. If you have been to London, you know the Oyster card, which basically just swipe over a terminal and then you pay your fare. Uh, the same is Felica. It's used in Japan and more widely throughout China and over the whole world, as you uh, have heard by Lucas, uh, RFID technology, that is RFID technology, I should mention, is used in a lot of places already. Um, this, uh, these RFID technologies are mainly based um, on, a, on the concept of having a reading device and having a passive card. So you always have an active and a passive component. Now if you go to NFC, which um, includes these standards and refer refines them, um, devices can actually switch modes, so they can become active and passive um, in different times. These are then called initiators for the active device and uh, targets for the passive device. Uh, and those can switch roles at pretty much any time they want in uh, their communication. Um, NFC restricts the band which is used to 13.56 megahertz, the same as the contactless cards in the ISO 1443 standard. Um, and furthermore, uh, bandwidths are 
restricted to 106, 212, or 424 kilobits. So that's not a lot, but still a little bit less than Lucas told us about 800 kilobits for RFID, which is possible. Um, and NFC, as it builds up on those uh, previous standards, is also compatible with these. So it would be possible to just exchange uh, current contactless cards with an NFC device which emulates an old card. So for, uh, so for example, for transport for London, you could just exchange uh, those Oyster cards with your phone and it would work just the same. Um, then what about data exchange? Um, when you exchange data, you probably need a packet format or a data exchange format. For NFC, that's specified by, by the NFC forum about two years later in 2006, and that was call is called NFC data exchange format, or short NDEF. Um, it consists of so-called NDEF messages. Those messages have uh, records, an unlimited amount of records, I should say. It depends on the application, how much you want to put in there. There's always a beginning record, which signifies the begin. There's records in between, which can also, again, embed another NDEF message. And there's an end record signifying the end of one NDEF message. Um, the records themselves, as I said, are unlimited. You can have as much as you want of them. Uh, the data format of those is defined by uh, so-called NFC forum types. Those are predefined by an NFC forum, like for text, URIs, or a new smart poster standard where you have uh, actions embedded in a poster. So for example, if you scan a poster, a uh, website opens, or an SMS gets pre-filled, you can send that, uh, similar to that. There's also a signature record type where you can embed um, cryptographic, cryptographic keys inside a tag so you can authenticate the message you're reading. Um, however, you can also use any MIME type you wish or you can use define your own URI types. Um, also, there's some fun stuff where you, where, you can do, where, you, where you can link records to each other so you can have uh, composed messages. And of course, as I told you, you can nest them inside. Then about applications. The NFC forum promotes applications in the area of access control, like in uh, RFID, we have seen for RFID. Uh, consumer electronics, which is probably the biggest market right now. Uh, healthcare, as we have heard. Information collection and exchange. Loy loyalty and coupons, which is also a big thing, including payments. And then, of course, as I told you, transport systems, like public transport. So I'm going to go, go through some of the most popular applications. Uh, the first one are so-called NFC tags. Um, I have one with me right now. So it's basically a small circuitry, as you have seen. And can I give the round? You can pass it around. Um, and these are basically small storage devices where you can put up to a kilobit, a kilobyte of data on them. And they are read and written by an active NFC device. So those tags are completely passive. They don't emit any signals of their own unless you put a device on it and it manipulates the field through induction. We've heard that before. Uh, you can store um, inf uh, information like URLs or text, uh, business cards, for example. You can have small business cards uh, with an RFID, um, sorry, NFC tag embedded in them. Um, and as I also said, you can um, program them with actions. So uh, a common use case right now, which is uh, exploding on the internet, is you have an application on your phone, NFC equipped phone, like from Sony with their smart tags, or NFC task launcher, if you know that from Android, where you can uh, program the tag with an action like switching your navigation system on and connecting to the car's Bluetooth uh, stereo system if you place your phone on a tag in your car, for example, in the morning, so you don't have anything, you just place it there and everything activates by itself. Same goes for website URLs and as I told you. All right. Uh, those stickers come in various forms, as I already told, uh, like smart cards, wristbands, everything you can imagine. Then the next usage scenario is sharing, of course. With Web 2.0, we saw the rise of sharing everywhere. It is popular to share content with your friends, family, and friends. 
I will tell them. Um, for the purpose, there is a protocol called Simple NDEF Exchange Protocol, or short SNAP. Um, it is a simple <laughs> request response format uh, based on a client server architecture because we only have two devices, an initiator and a target, and they can then exchange information at will. Uh, the common use cases are to share contacts, links, again, or small photo photos because the data rate is really slow. Uh, if you want to share uh, larger data files, you can use NFC to establish, for example, a Bluetooth or a Wi-Fi connection without having to pair or switch passwords. You just tap the phones together, data gets transferred, you send a video, video file or something similar. Uh, the most prominent technology doing that is called Android Beam, which was introduced in Android 4.0, but the Bluetooth connection I just mentioned was introduced with 4.1, so you can just tap your phones and send larger chunks of data. Uh, Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8, which are upcoming operating systems by, well, they are technically already released by Microsoft, um, except for Windows Phone, uh, <laughs> which is coming about hopefully. Um, they have NFC included in the operating system. So, for example, for Windows Phone 8, it is mandatory that every phone has an NFC interface. So, uh, Microsoft is betting big on that technology, as are a lot of other companies. If you have seen smartphones come with NFC technology embedded like all the time, except for, um, except for Apple, again. But we don't know what they're doing. If they're waiting out for something, we'll see. Um, then, Probably the most interesting use case for the industry themselves is financial services. Um, there are currently like three, or let's say two, and those, the second one can be split into two um, technologies. Uh, the first one for paying is simply a contactless card, like we just heard from Lucas, but instead of using RFID, restricted to uh, NFC technology. Uh, in Germany, there's currently called Giro, Giro Go or Giro Go. I don't know how to pronounce it, and it's uh, implemented by Sparkasse, Raiffeisen Bank, and a lot of other banks. And they're currently trialing it really big in Hanover and the surrounding areas with some big partners, which I won't name now. And it's basically you have your banking card. It has an NFC chip inside. You have to charge it in advance with up to 200 euros. And then you go to a cashier's terminal and pay up to 20 euros by just swiping. Again, without any chip or signature, uh, without any pin or signature required. Um, the second way of doing this is having a phone, uh, your um, smartphone you have in your pocket. And one way of doing it is to install an application like Google Wallet or hopefully sometime coming later this year, ISIS in the, United, in the United States, or as I told you, the MasterCard PayPass SDK, which would allow the same thing, um, where you link your credit cards uh, to that application or to the service for the application, you enter a PIN, and then you scan your phone on the cashier's terminal. Um, Microsoft is following a, a more secure way, we don't know yet, which uses a secure SIM element. So basically that's a SIM card which allows cryptography and authentication, and all communication with the cashier's terminal goes through that SIM card, avoiding the possi possibly dangerous application environment of the phone which might intercept or change and modify data. All right. Then, some other fringe use cases are in healthcare and federal. So as, as we have heard, passports are already equipped with RFID. Right now, no one is really working on NFC technology because the RFID technology has already been deployed, it has been secured, and it will probably require a long time for the next cycle to come and this NFC technology being uh, embedded in more stuff like our driver's licenses in like the US, but using NFC technology. Um, healthcare, the same thing. Uh, we have healthcare standards which have to be uh, relied on. Data needs to be secure and authenticated because if you have a patient chart and you read data from it and it has been manipulated, it may cost someone's lives. So there have to be standards uh, to emerge, have standards to emerge uh, to realize that. Then in public transport, uh, there are already several applications, like in Germany, the Deutsche Bahn uses their touch and travel program. 
Uh, basically, you have NFC tags on every station, and then you scan them with your phone, automatically determining the start and end station, and then you're built for the distance you actually have traveled. Uh, in addition, tickets are then read via your NFC interface of the phone, so if the guy on the train asks for a ticket, you just show your phone, tap it against uh, his device, and you're good. Uh, Transport for London has already tried NFC technology way back uh, with the first Nokia phones that have been released. And even then, customer satisfaction was as high as 96%. They wanted to have it. However, Transport for London is holding off, they say, because the technology with uh, the secure SIM, which they used, is still too slow. So the old RFID cards still are very fast to scan and to read, and they're waiting for the NFC as secure SIM stuff to get faster so you can deploy it everywhere. But the customers are ready, so they're just waiting for the technology, they say, and wait and wait, and we're going to see what happens. So um, a few words about risks and attack surfaces. Uh, NFC tags or NFC devices by default, the standard does not require, require any encryption or any authentication. So it is completely optional. Applications, it is at merit of applications to handle that. And we all know how that can turn out. If the one guy uses this sort of encryption, uh, this guy thinks, oh, I can do a better encryption algorithm or better authentication than anyone else. I do it on my own. And it, it always breaks and is totally insecure. Um, so this opens it up to, this opens the NFC up to a lot of uh, attacks, like the most basic one, as we've heard, again, eavesdropping. You can just listen uh, onto what everyone's saying because even as NFC is restricted to a range of about 4 to 10 centimeters because of power used, um, you can still listen on it in optimal conditions of up to 10 meters, it has been suggested. However, that is under really optimal conditions, so nothing covered or something. So it's more like if you're standing close to someone, you probably already have one and read it. Um, the most simplest form of attack would be denial of service. You just jam the signal whenever an NFC device tries to talk to with an, uh, talk to another one, uh, and the receiving device will see that there's another field incoming and just break off the communication, and you have to start over again. So you could have a lot of fun by going into a supermarket where you have a merchant's uh, station, and with the right equipment, you could uh, exactly at the time someone tries to pay, could jam the signal, and yeah, you know how that will turn out. Um, how about modifying the data which is transmitted? It is possible uh, because of the encodings that are used to flip single bits. So you can exchange whole messages, but you can flip single bits that are transmitted. Uh, it's not really that useful if you have something secure when it's encrypted, but you can still have fun with it. Um, again, another basic one is just, as you have seen those small tags, you can simply scratch them off and replace them with some of your own. You can, for example, then put your own website URL in, uh, which looks similar to the login site of whatever, MasterCard or something, and just fish up some data. Or um, even more fun, put, it, put a link in which exploits a browser vulner vulnerability and then infects the phone or whatever you want to do. Um, one of the most sophisticated attack, but probably one of the most, uh, uh, with the biggest potential, are relay attacks. Those are really fun. So basically all you need, I'm giving you all the instructions here, is two phones or devices which is an NFC interface which can be paired through a high throughput data link like Bluetooth or wireless LAN. Uh, then you grab a buddy of yours, go to the nearest supermarket where there's NFC payments available, uh, send your buddy towards a customer or close to it, and you go to the um, uh, terminal, prepare to pay, and once you're ready to pay or you have to pay, you say, your buddy, go closer to this customer. Here's probably a card. We're going to try. Uh, stands close to him for a few seconds. And then what happens is basically this. The customer on the left side has his banking card somewhere in his pocket or something. Your buddy stands close to it with uh, his phone, NFC on his phone, and just scans the tag. And through the, NFC, uh, through the Bluetooth link, um, 
this is handed over to uh, your phone where you're standing at the cash test terminal and try to pay and you're basically fooling the card of the customer to think that it would communicate with the cashier's terminal. You just bridged connections. And this works because as NFC is a wireless technology, you have uh, to allow for certain margins of uh, lag. So uh, current devices allow potentially up to 30 seconds. So you could send it around the world a few times if you would want. New ones are restricted to a, f to a few hundred milliseconds, but you can still do it because Bluetooth or wireless over short distances is really still fast. And yeah, you, you can do have uh, you can have some real fun with this. Um, don't get caught. I didn't tell you that how to do this. Um, it has been successfully tried, so it works. A possible workaround for what I just told you: the real attacks are. Um, restricting the phone and the card only to work if they are in the same position. That only works for, uh, uh, probably if you have a phone where you can tap into the GPS signal or the wireless positioning system. However, that is not really accurate. It has just been suggested that that might be an influence factor to determining if you should go through with a transaction or not. However, there are probably solutions being worked on including, no, encryption doesn't work, of course. That's, that's all right, um, then as you can see, man in the middle is crossed out because technically you can't really do it. NFC is designed as a one-to-one -one, uh, communication um, protocol, and once you have a third device generating their own magnetic field, the other device is just shut off. Because you say, there has been an error, I can't understand the other device. device. So as soon as there is more than one magnetic incoming magnetic field, of your man in the middle device, everything breaks. So man in the middle is impossible. Um, except the implementation, implementation is bad of the standard, but the standard requires it, that the connection breaks off if there's another field. Uh, then of course, as I told you, implementation vulnerabilities, application developers make mistakes. It doesn't always work out as they intended to. Um, I'm gonna show an example later on. Uh, and of course, loss or theft. You can lose your credit card, and someone can then just go pay off these 20 euros over and over and over until whatever. Um, however, to prevent this, you can have sane limits, like you always have to approve if there's an incoming NFC connection. Have you time for this? Oh, okay. Uh, for example, Charlie Miller told uh, or showed at Black Friday 2012, so a few weeks ago. Uh, that by default Android Beam, as I told you, this sharing technology uh, is not really secured. So you can just come on with your own device which implements the protocol, tap it to any device and the receiving device as, um, as it is unlocked or if it is unlocked will just accept it, the incoming message and then open the web page you have sent it or open a PDF document which includes your vulnerability and then you're screwed. Um, yeah. So to circumvent that, just have same defaults. Always have the person confirm it. So do you want to do this or do you want to pair the Bluetooth device? So for Bluetooth, they're asking, but not for other stuff. Uh, or with Nokia and their Amiga operating system, they also have uh, NFC baked in. Um, you can flip a switch, but it's settling the enable by default that you are getting asked each time for every form of data you receive. Do you want to do this? Do you want to view the bookmark? Or do you want to discard it? So it's simple to uh, prevent uh, malicious activity, but uh, the guys have to implement it. Uh, again, you can encrypt the connection. It's relying on the application. And you can authenticate. As I told you, there's a signature record type. You can have a public key infrastructure if you have to. Uh, you can make it secure, so it is possible, but you have to actually do it. So what's going to happen with NFC? Uh, standards uh, are probably going to emerge. Uh, for example, the payment companies have formed a consortium and they're hoping to talk to each other and then go to a streamlined industry direction. So they have one payment solution and not 500 where you have to choose. Um, Implementations will hopefully get more secure over time as with every software that is openly available, hopefully. Um, 
then because NFC is so easy to use, it just requires tapping your phone to another phone or tapping your banking card uh, to the merchant's terminal. It is coming. People are going to use it because it is so dead simple. Uh, to set things up, for example, a Wi-Fi connection, you just tap your phone, the connection details get transmitted, it's set up instantly. It's going to be used everywhere. So it's going to be soon, if not, if it is not already in a device near you, except, well, the Apple devices, we're going to hold out on that and hope, but we can't do anything. And meanwhile, um, if you want to prevent anything happening to you, just turn the NFC off. There's an off switch in every phone I know. I know. So if you don't want to get data stolen or whatever hacked, just turn it off, like Bluetooth. But hopefully it will change. It doesn't end up like Bluetooth where you have to always turn it off. But we're going to see. So uh, thanks very much, and I'm open for questions. Everybody happy. Ich habe keine Einblicke in Apples Infrastruktur, aber es, es wird vermutet, dass Apple also entweder noch abwartet, dass sich die Standards vereinheitlichen, weil wie gesagt, es gibt zurzeit Windows und Microsoft mit ihrem eigenen Standard, mit der Secure SIM, dann Google Wallet und das ISIS System, das Anwendungen benutzt, um Kreditkarten äh, zu verbinden. Dann gibt es noch von Mastercard und Visa, wie wir gesehen haben, äh, die RFID-Karten, die sind jetzt zwar nicht eher NFC, äh, NFC, aber werden es demnächst mit dem Papers SDK. Und es wird vermutet, dass Apple einfach noch abwartet und sich nicht da reinstürzen will und sich auf eine Technologie festlegen will, die dann vielleicht nicht so gut ist wie die anderen. Weil, wie man ja weiß, Apple Devices sind jetzt ein Massenmedium und wenn Apple das implementiert, dann machen es alle so. Und wenn es dann äh, irgendwelche großen Probleme gibt, dann zeigen natürlich alle auf Apple, ja, ihr macht doch immer die tollen Sachen und es ist super gut immer, was ihr macht, aber in dem Fall, ja. Es ist ein Grund, der vermutet wird, aber natürlich weiß es keiner. Konkurrenz im Bereich von Also wie gesagt, es gibt die Vorgängertechnologie RFID, die immer noch sehr stark benutzt wird, zum Beispiel von Visa und Mastercard, die kontaktlosen Karten benutzen RFID und nicht NFC, die sind schon etwas älter. Und es gibt natürlich noch massig Anwendungen, zum Beispiel im öffentlichen Nahverkehr, die alle noch RFID weltweit einsetzen. Die Technologie gibt es ja einfach schon länger. Also NFC, der Standard, vereinheitlicht es. Also die kontaktlosen Smartcards, die auf RFID basieren, können mit NFC-Geräten benutzt werden. Also NFC-Geräte müssen diese Karte zum Beispiel lesen können. Zum Beispiel den Tag, den ich hier rumgereicht habe, das ist ein MyFair. Und das ist eigentlich ein RFID-Tag damals benutzt. Aber NFC kann zum Beispiel die, die Tags auch emulieren. Also das ist in dem Standard drin, zusätzlich zu den NFC-Technologien noch. Das heißt, es ist alles untereinander kompatibel. Wie gesagt, der Transfer for London benutzt die RFID-Card und man könnte einfach das mit einem NFC-Phone austauschen, das einfach eine RFID-Karte emuliert. Also nur eine Frage. Nö, nö, also es ist, äh, baut eben auf dem ISO 14443 und den Fliegerstand ab, die operieren alle in dem gleichen 13,56 äh, MHz Frequenzband und die Technologien sind alle sehr, sehr ähnlich und NFC ähm, baut diese Standards praktisch ein und äh, zusätzlich unterstützt noch andere Funktionen, wie eben, dass sie äh, das passive und aktive Gerät austauschen können, dass also bidirektionale Kommunikation möglich ist. Ähm, ja, also... Die, ähm, alle NFC-Geräte, die NFC Forum zertifiziert sind, müssen diese alten Standards unterstützen und die neuen. Also es ist alles in einem Protokoll praktisch reingepackt. Weil, wie gesagt, es ist, die Frequenz ist gleich, die Technologie ist sehr ähnlich. NFC hat dann bloß noch zusätzlich Restriktionen und Features.
Ja. Also Google Wallet zum Beispiel, äh, wie gesagt, ist eine Applikation, die auf dem Telefon vorinstalliert wird und man linkt dann seine Kreditkarten über Google äh, da rein. Äh, in den USA ist es zum Beispiel so, dass Verizon, das ist ein groß, der größte Mobilfunkanbieter, Google Wallet auf seinen Telefonen einfach blockiert. Das funktioniert einfach nicht. Äh, und zwar deswegen, weil Verizon an ISIS arbeitet. Das ist ein alternatives Payment System, das aber noch nicht veröffentlicht ist. Aber sie blockieren Google Wallet aus dem Grund, da ISIS ja demnächst irgendwann kommt. Angeblich kommt es Ende dieses Jahr. Schauen wir mal. Ähm, und der Faktor hier ist, äh, letztendlich werden es wahrscheinlich die Mobilfunkanbieter entscheiden, denn die kontrollieren die Endgeräte. Also zum Beispiel in den USA ist das viel schlimmer als hier bei uns. Verizon kontrolliert wirklich komplett alles an den Endgeräten, inklusive Support und so weiter. Und wenn die Provider dann nicht mitspielen mit deinem Payment-System, wie im Falle von Google Wallet, dann hast du Pech gehabt und denen ihr System wird sich durchsetzen, weil es eben auf dem Telefon vorinstalliert ist. Was haben wir denn noch? Genauso, das Secure, der Secure-SIM-Standard zum Zahlen braucht ein Secure-SIM-Element. Und wer gibt die SIM-Karten aus? Die Mobilfunkprovider. Das heißt, wir haben wir, die Mobilfunkprovider, die im Prinzip dann entscheiden, welche Technologie benutzt werden kann. Man kann natürlich bei uns hier einfach wechseln und äh, dann auf einen anderen Standard vielleicht umsteigen. Vodafone, haben wir O2, alles Mögliche. Die trialen, glaube ich, alle um. Ähm, ja. Es gibt aber jetzt seit ein paar, ich glaube zwei, zwei Monaten, gibt es ein Konsortium, wie ich erwähnt habe, mit dem Prinzip allen, die ich jetzt erwähnt habe, also Google, Visa, Verizon, alle Mobilfunkprovider in den äh, großen Mobilfunkprovider in den Vereinigten Staaten, äh, Mastercard und so weiter, die äh, sich jetzt, also sie versprechen, sich jeden Monat zusammenzusetzen und erstmal zu reden, was denn jetzt los, was denn passiert bei ihnen, was für Technologien sie jetzt demnächst einführen werden. Und man hofft dann in der Zukunft, äh, es so weit fortzuführen, dass man einfach gemeinsame Standards entwickelt oder die Technologien zumindest untereinander kompatibel macht. Aber das liegt noch eher in der Zukunft. Also NFC wächst jetzt erst so richtig, es fängt jetzt erst so richtig an, äh, sich auszubreiten und wir werden abwarten müssen. Aber es wird sich wahrscheinlich ein Monopol rausbilden, weil wie bei allen Technologien, die Leute sind irgendwann verwirrt und wenn es dann so kompliziert ist und nicht funktioniert und man braucht immer ein anderes äh, System, um es zu benutzen, dann benutzt es einfach keiner mehr, obwohl es so einfach ist. Oder es benutzen nur wenige und es sind sonst gut. Also alle. Äh, nein, nur die, die eben auf diesem ISO 14443-Standard oder Filika-Standard basieren, äh, das sind im Prinzip äh, die Standards, die vorher für contactless Smartcards verwendet wurden. Alle, die funktionieren praktisch auch mit NFC-Geräten. Wenn es die gleiche Frequenz ist, dann kann es möglich sein, weil es ist ja dann nur Hardware, man muss dann nur seine eigene Software dazu schreiben. Das ist ja dann bloß physikalische äh, Gegebenheit. RFID benutzt viel mehr Frequenzen, wie der, äh, der Lukas vorhin gesagt hat. Aber NFC legt es definitiv auf 13,56 MHz fest, wie es schon vorher für die Smartest äh, Cards benutzt wurde. Und das wurde dann halt jetzt fest, fest äh, vorgegeben. Gut. Mein NFC Tag. Die sind teuer. Es, es, ist echt, es, ist, es ist echt Wahnsinn. Lukas sagt ja 5 Cent für einen billigen RFID Tag. Ich habe für die Dinger, also es, ich muss so sagen, es kommt jetzt halt richtig auf und die ganzen im Internet, die Händler bieten jetzt natürlich an und Shops sprießen aus dem Boden, die NFC Tags in allen möglichen Formen und Farben anbieten. Und ich habe für fünf Stück habe ich 10 Euro bezahlt. Ja, also die kassieren einen dann noch richtig, richtig ab. Aber 
Also mit der Zeit wird es auch runtergehen. Die versuchen natürlich alles billiger zu machen und man, dass man es sogar drucken kann einfach und ja, werden wir sehen. Mit viel Glück. Gut, danke.